I feel like I could ask you dozens, hundreds of questions based on the limited amount I know about your career, but I've, I've done a little bit of research and you have a, an illustrious background, but we'll start the way we've been starting all these interviews. What is your definition of smart manufacturing and what does it mean to have a smart manufacturing mindset? Good question. I mean, obviously, you're probably getting 10 different definitions from That was kind of the hope. People. Yeah, looking for some overlap, looking for some unique elements as well. For sure. I mean, for me, smart is smart everything, right? It's, I think a lot of us focus on making the equipment smart. Um, it's making people smarter. It's making our processes smarter. It's making the products we produce smarter. Um, you'll see a lot of people will talk about it being very data-driven, right? as if it's something new. I mean, you, you've been around this long enough to know we've been collecting mass amounts of data in this space for a very long time. I think now the transition is how can we use it to do something? The other dimension, of course, is you're gonna hear a lot about AI. And similarly, we've been leveraging it in very simple ways like machine vision and so on. Now we're starting to do some more advanced things to assist operators and to uh, close loop control with AI. So. For me, it's just an aggregate of lots of really interesting technologies to help us do things better. So when did you first start coming across the term smart manufacturing in your career, and what was the context? That's a great question. I actually can answer that question. Okay. Uh, I, we've all used so many different, that's a challenge in our sure. space, right, <laughs> is defining those. Um, I would actually say, probably SESME, maybe when I got involved with SESME, I, I heard that term front and center. Okay. All right, all right. So, what uh, roughly what year was that, or what year would like so maybe mid two or three years ago? Two or three years ago. Okay, so relatively new when you started hearing it come in vogue. Realize I've been around long enough for the term computer integrated manufacturing sim to have been a thing. So. Okay, all right, fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Well, because you've been around for a while, I was looking at your career background, and the first question I have to ask is, did you leave Wonderwear twice to go found? manufacturing software companies that changed the game. So, actually I left three times okay. and uh, the first two times I left I had been traveling quite a bit for work and my wife was pregnant within about a month. Of both times I left right. Wonderwear, I was very nervous leaving the third time but uh, um, actually I, the, the last time to start ThingWorks I had just left SAP where we were doing a lot of research work around con essentially connected everything. Um, but basically, it was seeing a gap, right? And the, and my, uh, the Lighthammer stuff was we saw the growth of SCADA and Historians. Um, every customer I encountered had just a mixed bag of so many different products and solutions and homegrown stuff. It's like, how can you tie all that together? So very, I, I've learned um, different companies have a different appetite for kind of internal innovation. Similar situation uh, at SAP. When I joined there after Lighthammer was acquired, um, it became obvious that to do something kind of n truly novel, you kind of need to be outside of the big co environment, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what led to ThingWorks. So you mentioned you saw a gap when you went to found Lighthammer. Yep. What what gave you enough confidence to leave Wonderwear to go do that to create Lighthammer software development? Like, what was your vision? That's a great question, and and I think we actually have official term we've used at both companies called bridge functionality. And what bridge functionality is, what is it? Yeah, we're building flying cars, or we're building some amazing thing, but what's the functionality that we know customers need and can buy today? At the time, that was, I want to be able to visualize all of my information from all my different systems, and ideally, I can do that remotely. Internet technologies were just starting to hit, you know. So I kind of felt pretty confident that providing you know, uh, these new kinds of visualization would be a good starting point. Um, plus I had, to be honest, the other big benefit was I had I'd been on the sales side for a number of years, okay. so I had good relationships with the distribution channel. Um, and all my work in advisory stuff, uh, it, a, a pattern's pretty common is go to market's the hardest part. Yeah, a lot okay. of people create great products. We had a little bit of a head start because we had this kind of uh, uh, go to market relationship. Okay. So then you mentioned you you left Wonderware on more than a few occasions to start a company. So what I want to know is, since you did this multiple times, you went on to found ThingWorks in 2008, leaving Wonderware again. What did you do differently when you created ThingWorks? Like, think about the lessons learned from the first soiree of creating a company. 
I mean, there's the, the natural, uh, yeah, uh, almost 10 years of technology evolution. So kind of fundamentally different, web first, you know, very different architectural approach. Um, but I think the big difference, uh, and this came out of the work we were doing at SAP, um, which incidentally, uh, that team, that research team, led to a lot of what we call Industry 4.0. Okay. It was a, I had a German-based team that was doing a lot of these projects. We had something we called real-world awareness, and that was what happens when you can integrate the physical world with healthcare and manufacturing and public safety and security, and it was pretty clear there weren't any software products to make that easy. Um, so that was kind of the, all right, there's an opportunity here, someone's got to fill that gap. Um, and then the difference between kind of industrial IoT, connecting up all of our PLCs and SCADA, all the stuff for MES, but then the broader IoT, connecting up these, when we talked at the very beginning, as the products become smart, as the product, the, the compressor out in the field is, you know, beaming data back, the filling machine is, you know, is being monitored and optimized by the OEM, kind of new kinds of business models for um, connected products as well. So I have an, a question for like the audience out there. Based on your experience, what advice do you have for manufacturing leaders that want to transform your businesses or asked a different way, more relative to your background, what advice do you have for manufacturers on seeing what's possible rather than just what's been done before? That's right, you know, it's a, a, your great segue because we hear a lot about salespeople saying, um, sit down with your customers, ask the customers always right, ask them what their problems and opportunities are. And in my experience, that doesn't actually work very well. Um, it's a human thing that we bound our responses, but what we think the art of the possible is. So even if there is some solution out there that can solve it, if they're not aware of it. Um, so uh, facilitating those discussions with customers to really get down to the root of what their, their real opportunities and problems are. Um, and it has to be a facilitated discussion. Um, the other thing that's always been front and center for me is your people. I mean, I just passionately believe that the knowledge of your people, um, using technology to make your people more capable, um, to empower them, to listen to them, um, that's got to be at the root of your digital transformation. Uh, you, can't, you can't top down this kind of stuff. And in fact, there's a lot of insights and brilliance you're missing out on if you're not uh, speaking to the people on the floor. So that would be great advice to end our interview on, but I've got one more fun question to ask you before we wrap things up. Your LinkedIn profile says you are certified 100% AI free. What, is, what does that mean? <laughs> well, I think when we saw the kind of the chat GPT uh, and LLM trend going, it became pretty obvious when a lot of people were posting content that was, it was obviously not their words, yeah. right? Um, so it's basically hype free, I guess, and I'm trying to be accurate. You know, my other side job is uh, LinkedIn BS detector, <laughs> semi-professional troll, but uh, just trying to, you know, make sure that the information, because let's face it, to your, to your exact point about how do people find out about uh, technology that they can use to transform themselves, if they're getting misinformation, that does no one any good, okay? So that's kind of a, something I, I do try and do is inform as well. No, I appreciate that. It was nice meeting you here today. I look forward to the first opportunity where you control some of my content on LinkedIn. So hopefully I'll see you on there as well. I appreciate you taking the time today, Rick. I look forward to that. Cheers.